This is Linda Joy Myers here, and I'm talking with Marika Biagio today. Welcome, Marika. Thank you, Linda Joy. Happy to be with you. <laughs> Me too. And we're talking about the story behind the story, which is the theme of, of my new newsletter and blog and something I'm absolutely fascinated in. And I think, Marika, both of us being interested in psychology, you are too. What happened? What's behind what we know, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So Marika is a psychology professor turned novelist who specializes in historical fiction based on real people. She enjoys the challenge of starting with an act, actual historical figures and dramatizing their lives and figuring out what motivated them to behave as they did, which is fascinating to me too. Um, so Marika has written quite a few other books, Parlor Games, Eden Waits, uh, and The Point of Vanishing. And her most recent book is The Model Spy which I just finished and I was fascinated by it. Marika has won many, many awards, almost too many to list, <laughs> but uh, Oregon Writers Colony, uh, Historical Novel Society Review Choice and others. And she's on the board of Historical Novel Society in North America. And that's where we met in June. So gl glad to have you, Marika. Thank you, Linda Joy. Well, there's so much to talk about, um, so let's just jump in. I see that you have specialized in your writing life uh, in writing historical novels. I'd like to know uh, why. What, what is it about the, that genre that draws you so strongly? Well, I actually, I kind of stumbled into it. Um, I have always wanted to write fiction. And, um, but I always felt like, well, I'm not sure what I would write about. And then um, I became fascinated. I started doing some genealogy research and I was fascinated by the story of my grandfather who came over from Switzerland in the late 1890s. And there was a large gap in his history when he came to this country and I thought, I'm gonna make it up. So that was my first foray into historical fiction. And mm -hmm. I loved it. Mm. I, I love the world building that you do when you're looking at a different time period and perhaps a different place. But it, of course, it takes a fair amount of research to do that. Mm. But I, I love the feeling of being transported back to another time and of transporting readers back to another time. So now in my reading, I, I pretty much read almost exclusively historical fiction and then sometimes some nonfiction for my research and so on, sometimes in a, a contemporary novel that's getting a lot of buzz, but I love historical fiction. I just love going to a different um, time period and learning about it and immersing in it. Wow. Yeah. So you're a time traveler lady. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, I, I totally understand that. And, uh, you know, I, as you know, I just wrote my first historical fiction novel, yes. myself, The Forger of Marseille. And, and I'd spent several years learning a how to write a novel because I was used to writing memoir. I mean, a lot of the same skills, you know, you need to do scenes, characters, dialogue, you know, you have right. to make a believable world, no matter what you're writing. Um, but also, I mean, did you ever suffer or do you ever enjoy or suffer from, you know, the research rapture of finding out all this stuff? Absolutely. I think, you know, historic writing historical fiction is demanding, as you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, you do have to master the craft, all the aspects of craft that go into drafting a novel. novel. You've got to you know, understand how to structure it, how to move the story forward, dialogue, um, how to entice the reader at the very beginning, all of these things. And on top of that, you need to research the period and place that you're writing about. So there's this addic additional demand on the historical novelist, which, 
which um, I mean, I enjoy the research process, but it it can be um, diverting at times because you can get really um, um, caught up in it, and you always end up researching a lot more than you ever than you could ever use in any one novel. You just, but you have to know all this mm-hmm. in order to decide what are the pertinent details to add to uh, paint a good description of the place yeah. um, to describe the period? Because um, you can't just take a, like a contemporary person and plop them into a, another time period because the mores, the norms, the expectations, societal expectations were so very different that you have to understand that time period in order to be able to convey your characters in a way that makes sense, that embeds them in the in in the times. You know, you for instance, uh, if you're writing about uh, somebody during the medieval period, you couldn't refer to them as an atheist. That was unheard <laughs> of when the church was the most powerful entity, and everybody was a part of the church. Mm-hmm. So you you can't just you do need to have your characters make sense within the period and in order to do that you've got to have researched it well. Well, you said that so beautifully. Um it reminds me of something that I ended up doing. I mean, I was happy to do it, but as I realized my time frame was 1940 Vichy France and and the books some of the books were talking about the you know, the quick armistice with Patin and all that and I I went well how the heck did he get to be in position and the country was in the position that they fell into immediately something must have been going on before that you know so then I read books that talked about the early part in fact I read into the 19th century uh you, you know like the all the way in and then World War One. And I went into that and read, you know, and then saw that the country was turning toward the right long before, you know, all these things happened in 1940, you know, and and was like, oh, my God. So there isn't much in there about it, but I I bet you the reader can feel if the ear I was trying to paint is working for them or not. You know, I'm hoping it does. Yeah, you're making a really good point that, you know, you you have to, like, understand the climate of the time. And, you know, as you said, to do that, you even had to go back a little farther to see how, you know, the evolution of the beliefs that 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 were part of that um, um, that culture, or that society at the time. Yes, that's that's, you know, it was really fascinating. Well, I can also see you know, when you're talking about, um, you know, the research, I, I I don't know, I have this sort of feeling that when I'm doing the research, I, I call it, I'd like to hear what you call, it. I call it filling the well, there's this like this big mm-hmm. well, and I got to mm-hmm. pour stuff into it, yes. and then figure out what comes out. I love that metaphor. That's great. <laughs> And then you pick, then you go fishing in the well. Uh, yeah, exactly. What, what are you going to pull up? What what needs to be in this scene and that scene? Well, tell me, tell me about how, I mean, we both have a background in psychology, so I'm curious about this. How does your unconscious, subconscious dream life affect your writing? You know, it does. And um, this is something that I think writers don't talk about that much, but it really is a right a part of the process um, that I will immerse myself in research about a person because I do write about actual people. Um, that's kind of the the uh, theme that runs through all of my historical fiction that these are real people. So. I really try to to you know learn as much as I can about them, but that at some point then, um, you know, my my subconscious does click in and take over. My very first novel, Parlor Games, is based on the true story of a woman who lived at the turn of the um, last century and was basically a con woman. Oh. And but 
she was a fascinating person. She traveled the world and she conned wealthy men out of their money. And I wasn't quite sure how to launch the story. How how can I get into this character? Because it's not me. <laughs> Why did you choose no. her? Why did you, or did she choose you or what happened? Well, I, I just stumbled across her story in a historical society in Michigan where she was from. Oh. And there was a little pamphlet there the, the first, the beginning of the pamphlet said the Pinkertons had her down in their files as the most dangerous woman in the world. Oh, God. OK. And I thought, <laughs> there's my next novel. This wasn't my first novel. It was first I've published, but it wasn't the first I wrote. But but her story just fascinated me. And so I, you know, I I read um, a newspaper. There was a series about her in the Chicago Tribune. I read all about that. But still, she was alien to me. You know, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a sociopath. No, you're not. <laughs> so I had to figure out how am I going to tell this woman's story? And I was out walking one morning and this the sentence popped into my head. I believe, dear reader, and these words come from the bottom of my heart that I can truly trust you. And I knew I had her voice. Oh. It just came to me. And then it was like, okay. May wants to tell her story, and I was off and running. And it was actually once I got that first sentence, it clicked, and the story started following. Wow, I love that! I love all that magic, hard work, and magic is (laughs) yes, kind of what it's all about. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, tell me uh, about some of the other books and who the characters are and how they came to you. If if you would. Sure. The sec, my second novel is uh, Eden Waits. And it is based on the true story of a utopian community that was formed in Michigan in the 1890s. And I knew about this story because the founders were my great times for grandparents. And my mother and my grandmother passed the story down to me And in the 1980s, um, uh, a scholar wrote wrote a book, a nonfiction book about this colony. And it was really, that was a fascinating time in American history, the 1890s. There was a very strong third party movement Uh at that time. Uh, It was the era of the robber barons, but also of great disparity in wealth. So this utopian community started up in response to um, the exploitation of the workers in a little mill town in Michigan. So mm-hmm. that was that was a labor of love also. And um, my mother, I was able to share a draft with of the novel with her before she died. So and and she was she she loved it. She thought it was wonderful. And right. she even said to me, "How did you know that Abraham sounded like that?" Well, of course oh. I did. I made Abraham up, but. It worked. Oh, that's lovely to get the, that kind of acknowledgement from someone who know, knew, knew more about the story. Yes. What about your book, The Point of Vanishing? The Point of Vanishing is based on the true story of um, a young child prodigy writer, Barbara Follett. And I first came across her story in a literary magazine where a nonfiction, um, an essay about her. And uh, she really led quite a fascinating, albeit short life. She was a twice published author by the age of 14. To to much acclaim, her novel was very well received, um, an adventure fantasy novel and then another adventure novel. And then um, her father left the family. He was her uh, muse and editor and her life fell apart. And um, when she was 25 years old in 1939, she disappeared, completely vanished. And nobody knew what happened to her. I think I have solved the mystery. And that is oh my gosh. what the point of vanishing is about. You're blowing my mind here. This is great. (laughs) (laughs) It's so fun to talk about these things, you know, and talk about, I mean, you're you're dealing with real people and going into their point of view, which 
as we were talking before we started, I was telling you that, you know, as a memoirist, I really, uh, I'm used to writing, you know, from my point of view. So yes. it was really a whole new idea to even think of writing from someone else's point of view. And so one of the characters in my book is a real person, Varian Fry, who lived. Right. But I was very shy and actually reluctant to go into his point of views but my three my three main characters I made them up though uh one of them is based on someone I knew um when I grew up who was a violinist uh mm -hmm. Mr. Lee and you know but the others were like made up out of whole cloth kind of and so I found that exciting and daunting I imagine you have so, but you're going to the point of view of real people and using the research. How? But your 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 novels must be peopled with other people. I guess they were real too, or you're making up characters also. How, how's that working for you? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I oftentimes I will have other key people who were real people. Um, involved uh, brought in too and and then um, I use what I know about them to try to accurately portray them sometimes they're fairly incidental but sometimes they're they're um, important characters like Barbara Follett's mother is mm -hmm. an important part of the point of vanishing story and she has some chapters from her perspective but Yes, some of the characters I do have been made up because I need, um, you know, I might need a foil or I might need the character to get from point A to point B and mm -hmm. have somebody that helps them do that. Right. So, um, so it's a mix uh, of uh, imagined and, and uh, actual people. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So, so let's talk now about the Model Spy. Uh, I love this book so much. Um, I mean, I was really, I knew nothing about this person. I i see your, you know, you begin. Oh, and I loved your dedication. My book's dedicated to democracy also. Uh, <laughs> yes, it's an important time to remind ourselves about democracy. Right. And, and, and you, begin, you begin in her point of view very clearly and you know, we're suddenly in Java. It's like, wow, where, who is this and where is she? I mean, it's not a place that I'd, you know, been participated in or knew anything about. So how did you choose uh, your heroine here? Tell us about her. Uh, you talk about her on the cover. This is based on the true story of Toto Koopman's World War II ventures. So tell us about this book and her yes. and you. Not many people know about Toto, um, but I think she may have been the first woman to spy for the British during World War II. Uh, mm -hmm. I stumbled across uh, a biography written by a French author and um, translated into English, and it's a biography about her whole life. And because she did lead lead a fascinating life, but I was most interested in her World War II experience. To me, that was the most dramatic wow. part of her whole life. Mm -hmm. So, but but the, the biography was a rather lean book. It didn't have a lot of depth to it. And he did interview some people who did know Toto. So there, there was some, uh, he had some primary source material, but for the most part, she didn't leave any diary or any account of her personal life. So it was really um, having to learn about her through this biography. And then, you know, just kind of uh, there were some incidental mentions of her in some other books that I was able to track down. So I, I mean, I feel like I had, I had to, to a certain extent imbue her with, um, a life that I imagined. I, another author might come up with a kind of a different portrayal because my portrayal was is just my construction and my imagining about you know given this woman, given what she did, the obvious courage that she had and and the dedication to the values that she had. I I I just had that to work with and hoped that. 
Um, and, and she was biracial and from, you know, her Hi. father was Dutch, but her mother was from, from, was Indonesian. So, you know, that was a reach, but I, I actually met a woman who was Indonesian while I was writing this novel. And I was really able to, to mine um, her knowledge and understand a little bit more about Java and what growing up in Java might've been like for Toto during that time period. So I was fortunate to have, to have found um, this, this young woman. Yeah. Um, and, um, but, but again, you know, I can't say that this is the Toto Koopman. I can only say I did my best to try to construct a, the Toto Koopman that, that shines through in her history. Well, I uh, love the idea. I mean, here here shows up uh, Churchill's son, yes. Randolph, you know, yes. and Beaver uh, Beaverbrook. You're right, Lord Beaverbrook. Yes, right. Those two, and the idea that she was, you know, this very sexy woman, mm -hmm. to a model, call her the model spy, you know, yes. um, and her relationships with them. So I presume you found a fair amount of documentation about them. That was, uh, yes, she did actually have relationships with uh, Lord Beaverbrook, and there's a biography of him mm -hmm. that documents that. She had a relationship with his son, a uh, four-year right. relationship, right. and she did have a relationship with Randolph Churchill, Churchill's son. Mm -hmm. So, yes, all of those are documented facts, and um her her experiences, the all the events of the war are based on her actual experiences um, that were reported in the biography and that were documented by uh, some first person sources. So so yeah, it is based on her her real experience. Mm -hmm. Well, it it was amazing. I was like, what? And what again you know so yeah. for this reader knowing nothing you know I knew nothing about it I mean we both have a strong interest in World War II obviously but um you know why so so somebody asked me this the other day um in one of my talks so why do you think people are still writing about or reading about or interested in World War II even now yeah, it is a very popular period, and I think there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, it was really the last great war that was fought for high ideals. Yeah. and But it wasn't so long ago that we don't have stories that have been passed down from not just uh, Americans, but so many Europeans. You know, so many people, millions of people were touched mm -hmm. by the war. And so many stories were passed down through families. So I think that there's just, it's there's a relatability to that war. Um, it was a noble effort. And um, it, was a, it was a well fought war for, for a good cause. And I just think it still resonates uh, today. Well, it, it, it seems to, and, and there are many, you know, some publishers are saying, oh, gee, there's been too many or so many World War II books. So we heard that a little bit, but I don't know. I mean, <laughs> 10 more were published that week, you know? Exactly. Uh, yeah. You know, They're still so, getting placed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So one question about your writing process. Um, there's this question that everybody asks, which is, are you a... Uh, plotter, outliner, or pantser, or both? How, what's your process of figuring all this out? Yeah, I, I am a rough outline in my mind writer. <laughs> so I do have a general sense of the whole scope of the story. You know, I usually have, have a sense of how, where it should begin and where it's going to end and the steps to get there. But then when, when I get down to the level of scenes, I, I'm, I'm pantsing it, you know, I'm like, okay, what's going to happen here? And I, I usually, I'll just start writing. And sometimes I get surprised. I know. And, yeah. you know, it's some, and that's actually, you know, a really, uh, I love that when that happens. 
um, when I feel like I've kind of uh, opening up my mind to these characters, put them in con in conversation with each other, or in some some kind of some kind of goal that they're trying to achieve, or fighting against each other, and and things happen. Um, so it, it's a little combination of both, and so, sometimes that's problematic if. Um, you know, I mean, I have written scenes that it's like, no, this isn't working. This doesn't make sense. And then I have to throw them out. But for the most part, um, having that rough outline in my head uh, means that I do kind of have a, I, I am groping my way along and I do kind of know where point A and point B and point C and D are. It's just kind of bridging, you know, mm. those those points together. Well, I'm heartened by what you're saying. I was so shocked at the conference that so many people were pantsers, you know, uh -huh. because yeah. I, I thought, I mean, I'm a new novel writer, right? And yeah. I struggled my way through this book for several years. I mean, for one, I mean, I don't think it's that unusual, but still, I was thinking, okay, now that I know about certain things about writing a novel, now I need to turn into an outliner so I can be much more efficient and get my book done sooner. Yeah. Uh -huh. And so I took a course with somebody and I got some assignments of outlining. I'm supposed to know the first scene and the last scene. And I last scene, huh? Well, how do I know? And then, you know, and then <laughs> what led to what, which are very yeah. questions. Um, and so I tried to outline for the last three months. Uh huh. I've gotten kind of uh, you know a few things I know I want to put in there so finally I realized last week I am not writing because I'm trying to outline um, I see and yeah. maybe I just need to do some writing yeah <laughs> you know it might just spark you uh to to know you know how to um how to proceed I mean if once you get one scene it can it can usually just kind of lead on and on well, thank you for that. Yeah, they're talking to me, you know, and I'm like, well, I don't Good. know where they are exactly what's happening. But I mean, I think, right, was your advice if, if to writers that are listening to this, you know, if the characters are, are are talking to you, you just write write a bunch of stuff down and see what happens, maybe. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Good advice, you know. Um, so Anything else you want to share about uh, your writing life or what you're working on next? Well, I've got a few things that I am working on now. Um, I'm writing, um, uh, I just finished actually, and we'll be kind of revising and working on a novel called Gun Girl and the Tall Guy, which is based on a uh, the true story of a couple who were Bonnie and Clyde in, before Bonnie and Clyde came along Whoa. in 1924 Brooklyn. So um, <laughs> they, uh, they really, the Brooklyn police force just could not capture these two. So it's, it's quite a wild ride, their story. So when do you think that book will be out? Uh, oh gosh. Um, it's hard to tell because I'm I'm uh, querying agents with it right now. So yes, I understand um, the whole publishing yeah, process. It's, it's yeah. One has to go through all that. That's <laughs> right. So tell us uh, cl in closing a little bit about the Historical Novel Society for people who the North American well both both branches just okay. so people know more about it. Okay. The Historical Novel Society was founded in the UK in the early aughts. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in, 20, in 2003, the uh, North America contingent of the Historical Novel Society was founded and had its very first conference in Salt Lake City. Mm. So the membership organization is the Historical Novel Society. You can join on their website. They send out a quarterly historical novels review that lists all kinds of historical fiction that has come out recently. And you can attend the UK conference in even years and in odd years. We hold the conference here in North America. The next one will be in 2025 in Las Vegas at 
got to be Caesar's palace. <laughs> so, um, and uh, it's a great conference, a lot of wonderful networking and um, authors are very supportive of each other at HNS. So um, people, people usually leave feeling very energized. Oh boy, I sure did. I was in San Antonio with you and in June, which is, you know, just last month, but you know, it, 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 it gave, I realized, well, I need to hang out with more historical novel writers because all the things I started to say this, all the things I was going through for four years, they all go through. <laughs> That's what everyone's going through, you know, and um, so I didn't realize all that. And so fun to talk about these things with, with you and with other historical fiction writers, because um, I think we need to we need to talk about these things. And that's what happened at the conference. Yeah, it's very validating to hear, you know, the struggles and the challenges and the successes of other um, authors. And, um, you know, the authors tend to be very supportive of each other. And I'm looking forward to reading The Far Forger of Marseille. Oh, bless so, you. Thank you so much great. for that. Well, I want to thank you so much for being part of the story behind the story. And um, people will be, uh, be able to find this conversation there. And I'm going to stop the recording now so we can also talk. Great. Thanks for the great conversation.